We have here a very special scripture. One that deals with the identity of the Christ. One that causes us to stop and reflect on what we're doing here. This is a mighty teaching. The heart of Christian understanding going down through the centuries. That which has strengthened millions of people just like us. So we need to understand it. We need to understand how demanding it is on our mind, especially we 21st century rationalists who like to put it in a box so we can understand it. It doesn't exist if we can't understand it. You know, the scientists say that in the fifth, if you took that 15 billion years of the Earth's evolution to this moment and condensed it down to one year, Human history is the last 10 seconds. There's a whole lot we don't know anything about. There is mystery upon mystery in the very nature of existence. And here at the heart of the teaching, we have this presentation of Jesus as more than just one of us. And that's going to bother some people. When we don't understand, we want to pull it down to make it like us so that we're comfortable and familiar. We've got seminary professors trying to reduce it down to, well, he was just a man. I mean, he was a prophet. He was a guy from Galilee. We're looking for his shoelaces out there. We've got to try to make it just like us. But here we have Paul, who not only didn't believe like many of us, but persecuted this bizarre sect this strange new teaching that, it was, that was at the dawn of transforming human history. And when Paul fell off that horse and went blind on his vision on the road to Damascus, what did he say? Who are you, Lord? And I hope that's in your heart today. Who are you? With all this beautiful music we've heard here this morning, the cello, the organ, the piano, the voice, all voices together, all music and poetry and imagery, trying to put into some shape, some expression, the mystery that we have in the Christ. Don't make the mistake to think he's just your good buddy or a nice, happy prophet who liked children. He is the image of the invisible God. What does that mean? The image of the invisible God. How does the invisible have an image? Don't make the mistake to think that it means that God must be a male with a beard and sandals. Big mistake. The image. That which cannot be spoken, cannot be understood, which Albert Einstein couldn't figure out. Did you know Albert Einstein had a question at the end of his life on his deathbed? You know what his question was? Did God have a purpose in creating the universe? We should know the answer. Of course he had a purpose. And we see it in the Christ. In that figure that walked the earth just like us is the answer to these questions. Is the pathway to understanding what cannot be understood. Imagine a world without the Christ where nobody knows anything about the mystery, where we make statues and we have some intuitions. Lao Tzu had some wonderful insight. But nobody knows. The heart of reality, the core of who we are, the purpose for all this, the meaning of beauty in the cosmos. Jesus, to put it in modern language, is the cosmos become conscious of itself. Jesus is the pattern, the expression of God's intention for our existence. In Jesus we discover that beyond the madness of human behavior, don't we know the madness? Forget the wars, the religious fights, what we're watching on television this week with some poor man's breakdown. How about in your kitchen? 
about human relationships. Chaos in harmony, pain. With the Christ we find the way out, the way to be the reconciling force in this world. This is big. This can change everything for you today. This can take your troubled relationships, your worries, your fears, and bring you peace. If you understand what this teaching is here today. The image of the invisible. It's like putting on glasses that allows you to see the sacred and the holy. Now some folks are blessed with having that naturally. Some of our artists, some of our more sensitive souls who look at a grain of sand and see infinity like William Blake. Who can see in beauty in the garden, even in the simple cornfield, something magnificent. Jesus does that for all of us. Like I told the children, in his eyes, in his words, in his actions, is manifested what it's all about. That in the midst of earthquakes, volcanoes, storms, death, ignorance, hatefulness is goodness. Unconditional love. You are forgiven by the one who made you. Let that sink in. Let that place of guilt and of pain that won't go away find relief today. Because in the Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. We can dare to believe that we know the purpose, the meaning of our existence, the source of life itself. That's what Jesus is to us. Not a man from long ago. Not a magic man that we can't comprehend or some God that we have to worship from afar. He brings into your life right now, into our humanity, that which is immortal, spiritual, eternal, and transformative. This is not a belief system. It's not an ideology. It's life and death for each of us. This doesn't place Christianity on one side and all the other religions on another. We know they don't. Forget that. This takes all the wisdom throughout humanity. The Native Americans love of the earth and understanding of its life. The compassion of the Buddhist. The wisdom of the Hindu. All of these glorious intuitions of truth and right living and nobility. And brings it together into its apex. Dare to believe that in the Christ is the apex of all human wisdom and understanding. Because nobody called the core of reality, the mystery of mysteries, Abba, Daddy. Close intimate, loving. This should melt down your alienation and your pain. That's the power of this truth. It isn't a religion. We've turned it into a religion. But we make a mess of everything, don't we? It's truth itself incarnate in humanity. And we're told that he is the head of the body, the church. That's what's wrong with churches, you know. We keep forgetting who it belongs to. It's not your church. It's not your grandparents' church. It's not my church. It's the church of the Holy One. It's a place in the world, one of the last places in the world, where the sacred is known. Where we have a shot at becoming all that we can be. It's not a social club. It's not a nostalgic walk down the past. It's the power of the Holy One here and now in this world today. That's why we are privileged to be here, to be part of its future, because it belongs to the One in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's power. For each of us to branch into, to tap into. 
You know, when I was in the Northwest, one of the strange things that we discovered with those 120-foot trees, if I haven't told you before, is that every time there's a little wind, trees fall down, knock off the electricity, and you spend three days with no heat, no air conditioning, no lights. Except for those who have a generator in the garage. They're the lucky ones. Friends, you've got a generator right here. In your knowledge of Christ, when you're down on your knees in hopelessness, in fear, in despair, in dead ends, He is there to turn it around. Not in some wild superstition. Fact. You can tap into the power of spirit here and now. And how tragic it is that theology, belief systems stand in the way. You've heard me quote this before from an old Belgian priest saying, Jesus did not come here to bring yet another religion. He came to bring us direct access to God. Nothing less. And so Paul says, I'm trying to bring you spiritual wisdom so that you may grow and bear fruit and have new understanding. If you're in a church where you're just the same last year as this year, something's missing. There should be some dynamis, some dynamite, some energy going in your life, affecting your choices, your insights, your perceptions, helping you along the way. That's what this is. Don't let the form block you from its power for here and now. You know, churches struggle as to whether we should sit in chairs or pews, whether we should have some espresso in the narthex to make everybody happy, keep you awake, whether the music should have drums or this or that. Forget about it. It's about the mystery of who the Christ is and the relationship that you can have with that eternal reality in the here and now. Nothing less. It's big. It's bigger than any of us, and yet it is funneled into our capacity to understand through his humanity. Christianity has been destroyed often by Christians, turned into its opposite. Don't let that fool you. It's about the one who reveals your true identity, your true purpose. So that whenever the world is trying to sell you its bill of goods about what you're here for, consumer, taxpayer, whatever, you remember who has the truth in his hands. And that's your faith. That's our belief. That's why we sing, because it's too big to contain. That's why it's okay to make noise in church. It ought to turn you on. Don't wait for the basketball game to do it for you. Let the reality of God's nearness touch your heart, excite you, give you hope for tomorrow, hope for bad relationships being restored, reconciled. In fact, it says in this scripture, you will be presented blameless. You will be freed of all your mistakes. Don't we all need a little bit of that? You'll be freed, you'll be cleaned of all of that if, wow, what an if, or provided you stay rooted in this faith of the gospel, this knowledge beyond knowledge that in the Christ we have the living God available to us up close and personal. Don't try to figure it out. Experience it in your heart. Know that it's the witness down through the ages of this ancient eternal faith that something happened when Jesus appeared in the world, not then but now, for you today. Let that be the power of your faith, the good news of the gospel. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, help us to know that you are here, that you are love incarnate, and that you are seeking us more than we seek you. We ask this in the power and glory of your holy name. Amen.